So we're now taking a further step towards the kidney, um, implemented by my colleague, um, Professor David Wheeler at the Royal Free and UCL, who's going to talk further about SGLT2 uh, and the kidney and sweetening the urine. John, uh, Chairman, thank you very much. It's a huge honor as a nephrologist to be speaking in this meeting uh, organized by, by cardiologists and diabetologists. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think I'm here because I gave a Grand Rounds presentation at University College Hospital, and uh, Derek was in the audience. So thank you very much for, for getting me here. Um, my job is to give you a renal perspective uh, on these drugs. And I'm going to start by briefly showing you my disclosures and then showing you the typical patient that I look after as, as a nephrologist. I should say that, that as nephrologists, around about 40% of the patients we look after have diabetes as a comorbidity. Uh, and secondly, despite our best efforts, most of our patients die prematurely of cardiovascular disease. So nephrologists are very interested in developments <coughs> in diabetology and in cardiovascular medicine. So, so here's the patient I look after. He's a 57-year-old male. He's overweight. He's had type 2 diabetes for at least 16 years. And I know he's got proliferative retinopathy, so I believe that this low EGFR and uh, fairly heavy albuminuria is a result of microvascular disease in his kidneys. And I'll probably be happy not to biopsy this patient, but to manage his blood pressure and with my diabetic colleagues to manage his uh, glycemic control. If you look at our two-dimensional classification system for chronic kidney disease, this is GFR, you're familiar with these stages. This is the level of albuminuria based on an albumin to creatinine ratio in a spot urine. So this is no albuminuria, this is what we used to call microalbuminuria, and this is more than microalbuminuria, so macroalbuminuria, this is about a gram uh, per day, and if you're from the States, you just add a zero uh, to these numbers and you get to the units that you're familiar with. But this gentleman falls into this category of G3BA3, and he's in the red on this heat map because he's at high risk. So here's no CKD, here's stage three. As you go across these um, different boxes here, the lower your EGFR and the higher your level of albuminuria, the higher your risk. Risk of what? This is risk of everything. This is risk of premature cardiovascular death. This is risk of progression to end-stage kidney disease. This is risk of acute on chronic kidney injury. This is risk of uh, unexpected hospital admission. And so we use this kind of grid um, as, as a risk map in the management of these patients. And this patient's in trouble. So as a nephrologist, I'm obsessed with his urine. I dipstick his urine. There's no blood. That's good because that might indicate another cause of glomerular disease. He's got protein, which I was expecting, and he's got glucose. He's got three plus of glucose. Oh dear, I say to the patient, I don't think your diabetic control is very good, believing that he's spilling glucose over into his urine because his plasma glucose is above the threshold of around about 12 millimoles per litre. Ah, it's funny, he said to me, because my diabetologist told me that my diabetes was really well controlled. Now I've started the new drug. Stupid nephrologist. So what do I do? <laughs> I take a drug history. He's on herbisartan. I like that because these drugs, we believe, are renoprotective in the context uh, of type 2 diabetes. And we put patients onto either ACEs or ARBs. He's on a bleta blocker at orvastatin. He's on metformin. That's okay because his EGFR has not yet dipped below 30. He's on glycoside. And, of course, the new drug, this was my introduction to the SGLT2 inhibitors. So he was on 10 milligrams of empagliflozin, and he had glycosuria uh, because of the medication. So I realize that my job is to keep you awake before coffee and that renal physiology just may not do that. But just bear with me for a couple of slides. This is a proximal tubular cell. This is the surface uh, that uh, lines the urinary space. So this is the tubule, if you like. Uh, this is the surface that is in contact with the blood vessel. 
So uh, here are the, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors on what we call the brush border, the, the side of the cell in contact with the urine. There's two SGLT2 inhibitors, the SGLT1 and SGLT2 inhibitors, and these are sodium glucose co-transporters. When glucose goes into the cell, sodium goes with it. The sodium gets out of the cell into the blood via this ATPase. This is a sodium-potassium ATPase, sodium out, potassium in. And the glucose in, is transported via the GLUT2 uh, transporter into the bloodstream. So we're looking at this part of the tubule here. This is where the glomerulus is. It's missing from this picture. And this is the rest of the tubule, the loop of Henle leading to the collecting duct. And in normal circumstances, so this is in health, we filter 180 grams a day of glucose at the point of the, at the glomerulus. That's around about 45 of those little square sugar cubes. And this glucose travels down the proximal tubule, but 100% is reabsorbed. Most of it by the SGLT2 inhibitor, a small proportion, 3% by the SGLT1 inhibitor, so that there is no glucose appearing in the urine. That's why we are surprised to see glycosuria. This is what happens in diabetes. Both of these two transporters are upregulated, as in GLUT2. We're filtering more glucose because blood sugar is high, and eventually, these two um, transporters, the SGLT2 and SGLT1, are saturated, and glucose passes on down the tubule and appears in the urine. And then with the drugs, the SGLT2 inhibitors, we're inhibiting uh, this transporter. The SGLT1 is likely to still be operative but becomes saturated, and so we are effectively blocking glucose uptake in the proximal tubule and enhancing both glycosuria and, as we heard this morning from Bernie Zimmerman, naturesis. So these drugs lead to more glucose in the urine and more sodium in the urine, and we've all, uh, we're all aware of the benefits um, of those, uh, those physiological changes. So let's go back to a, a little bit of basic renal physiology again. Th these are 11 patients with type 2 diabetes treated with canagliflozin. Um, this is a, a clamp study, so these patients are being clamped at different blood glucose concentrations, and we're looking at the appearance of glucose in urine. So here are the untreated patients with this very clear renal threshold for glucose. We're above 12 millimoles per litre blood sugar. The glucose starts appearing in the urine. Here are the same patients on canagliflozin, and notice here that at every blood sugar concentration, there is some glycosuria. And the amount of glycosuria is proportional to the blood sugar concentration. So at low blood sugars, only a little bit of glycosuria. Uh, these drugs don't seem to cause hypoglycemia. Now, nephrologists got excited about these drugs because uh, of their effects on estimated GFR and, and on levels of albuminuria. So these are from two of the phase, these are patients uh, recruited into two of the phase three dapagliflozin studies. And you're looking at patients here, 435 patients with two type, two, type two diabetes who are already on ACE inhibitors and who are randomized to receive either placebo or dapagliflozin five milligrams or dapagliflozin 10 milligrams. And you'll see here, this is estimated GFR over time, baseline being zero, larger drops in the patients receiving the dapagliflozin than in the placebo-treated patients. So there's a placebo effect here. Perhaps these patients were more compliant with ACEs and ARBs in the study, but bigger drops in EGFR in the patients receiving uh, the DAPA-5 and the DAPA-10 milligrams. And if you follow on through the study here, you see that when these drugs are discontinued, you effectively regain the GFR that you lost at the beginning. So fall in EGFR, that doesn't sound good. But remember that ACEs and ARBs do exactly the same as this. And nephrologists associate this effect with long-term renoprotection. We are perhaps reducing the pressure in the glomerulus with these drugs, as we heard this morning, and thereby protecting the glomerulus from high pressure. And if that is the case, we'd expect there to be reductions in albuminuria on these drugs, and sure enough, there are. So this is changing 
uh, urinary albumin to creatinine ratio from baseline. Again, there's a placebo effect, but there's a greater effect in the DAPA-5 and DEPA-10 treated patients uh, with a little bit of a fall off when these drugs are discontinued. So these benefits excited nephrologists because they were the same, uh, or I should say these effects excited nephrologists because they are the same effects that we associate with ACE and ARB use. And you saw this this morning in a much better animated diagram, but SGLT2 inhibition in the proximal tubule increases glucose load to the juxtaglomerular apparatus here where the distal tubule is in close contact with the afferent arteriole. And the increased sodium delivery here sends signals to the afferent arteriole to vasoconstrict. The kidney thinks it's well perfused and therefore shuts down uh, the, the blood supply to the glomerulus. And this is also from the work of, of David Cherney, looking at how these drugs work on the back of ACEs and ARBs. So here's your, uh, here's your glomerulus, here's the afferent arteriole, here's the efferent arteriole. As we all know, RAS inhibition, so ACEs and ARBs, inhibit the effect of angiotensin II on the efferent arteriole. They inhibit the constrictor effect of angiotensin II and lead to dilation of the efferent arteriole. And what the SGLT2s do on top of this, if given together, they constrict the afferent arteriole. And both these effects, if you think about it, reduce the pressure here in the, the filter, the glomerulus, and therefore may confer uh, renal protection. So let's look at the big studies. We've heard about these studies already today. This is Empereg, and I just want to emphasize that patients going into this study needed an EGFR of greater than 30 mils per minute and you know the rest. So there was an analysis of renal endpoints in this study that was published separately. Uh, Christoph Vanner, the first author, concedes that there was a, a little bit of a post hoc flavor to this analysis, um, but nonetheless it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and looked at a number of, comp or a composite that included uh, a number of markers of progression of kidney disease the new development of macroalbuminuria, a doubling of serum creatinine, the initiation of renal replacement therapy, dialysis or kidney transplantation, and death of the patient because they had end-stage kidney disease but they didn't receive dialysis or kidney transplantation. And you can see the number of events here and the Kaplan-Meier here effectively quite a striking 39% reduction in the risk of this composite endpoint that was called worsening or incident nephropathy. Now that was a little bit too good to be true. Here's a cardiovascular outcome trial um, of a diabetic drug uh, meant to show non-inferiority, ends up showing superiority from a cardiovascular perspective and showing a benefit in terms of kidney outcomes. So that was exciting. And if you look through the components of the composite, you'll see that there were similar effects, uh, effects of similar magnitude, when you look at all the, uh, the components of the composite endpoint. And then again, exciting to nephrologists, looking at EGFR throughout the trial. Here are the EMPA-treated patients. Remember, there were two doses of empagliflozin. These data were combined. Here are the placebo-treated patients you see this quite dramatic reduction in EGFR in the first four weeks of the study, consistent with a hemodynamic effect, and thereafter stabilization of EGFR as compared to placebo, no obvious hemodynamic effect, but a progressive decline in EGFR during the study. And then this June, we saw the CANVAS data. Now in CANVAS, the renal endpoints were pre-specified. Again, patients needed to have a GFR of greater than 30 mil per minute before they got into this study. So for the nephrologists among us, these aren't really the patients we're looking after uh, in our clinics. And here are the renal outcomes from CANVAS. This is a pre-specified 40% reduction in EGFR and end-stage renal disease or death due to untreated end-stage kidney disease. Um, here are the numbers of events. Here's the Kaplan-Meier. And again, remember 39% in EMPA, 40% reduction um, in the CANVAS studies. 
So consistent effects between these two drugs in these two studies um, on, on, on renal endpoints, although I'll concede that the renal endpoints weren't identical in both studies. So these are uh, uh, new data uh, shown at the American Society of Nephrology earlier this month and shown with Vlado's permission. Uh, this is a more standard renal outcome. This was the, the, the renal outcome that was used in the IDNT and renal studies in which we demonstrated that ARBs uh, were renoprotective. This is doubling of serum creatinine, end-stage kidney disease or renal death. And you'll see here almost a 50% um, difference in the uh, hazard ratio. And then the EGFR, again, in the, uh, in the CANVAS program, here's the acute decline on the canagliflozin. Uh, there were two trials combined here, different doses of cana. These are combined data. And here, the progressive decline uh, in EGFR on patients receiving placebo. So pretty consistent across these two studies. And also reductions in albuminuria uh, in CANVAS, uh, overall an 18% reduction in albuminuria. These were the starting points for the patients, so bigger reductions in those with micro and macro albuminuria compared to those who had uh, albuminuria within the normal range. So how about safety? These drugs reduce EGFR, and, and that could be interpreted as perhaps an acute kidney injury event in some patients. And so we as nephrologists have been very keen to look into these data sets to find out whether there are any safety signals. Uh, and this was presented at the, the ADA this year. This is a, a pooled analysis of the EMPA phase one to phase three programs. The EMPA reg study, of course, is in here. But we're looking at uh, 12,000 patients participating in these studies. And we're looking at investigator reported events that were reported as acute kidney injury. So remember that these are not clean data. These are investigator-reported events rather than adjudicated events. But if you look here at the number of events, if anything, the number of AKI, acute kidney injury events, were lower in the empagliflozin than the placebo group. I should really say there's no difference here, perhaps. And then if we look at the CANVAS data, acute kidney injury events in the CANVAS program, there's no uh, statistically significant increased risk here of acute kidney injury events. So from a renal safety perspective, that's reassuring. Now, what's fascinating to, to me about these drugs is how they're working in patients uh, with more advanced chronic kidney disease. So let's just look at these data. Again, these are from uh, the dapagliflozin program. This is, uh, th these are data from 11 phase three trials and you're looking here at patients receiving dapagliflozin, and you're looking at reductions in HbA1c compared to patients who received placebo stratified by EGFR. So green is an EGFR of greater than 90, um, purple is an EGFR of 60 to 90, and blue is an EGFR of 45 uh, to 60, so stage 3A chronic kidney disease. And the important point here is that the lower the EGFR, the less likely the intervention, the, the, the investigation or drug was to reduce HbA1c compared to placebo. So we went on to look at patients who'd been included in these studies who had more severely impaired kidney function. And this was again presented at the American Society of Nephrology we looked through the 11 uh, phase three studies. We found 220 patients who had stage 3B or 4 chronic kidney disease, so an EGFR of less than 45 mils per minute. And you're looking here at the mean adjusted change in HbA1c over time. These studies went out to about 104 weeks, and you're looking at changes from baseline with the time average changes shown here on the right. In these patients with stage 3B to 4 chronic kidney disease, no obvious differences in HbA1c uh, reductions comparing DAPA5 uh, in purple, DAPA10 in blue, compared to placebo in gray. So in advanced chronic kidney disease, these drugs don't appear to be lowering HbA1c, but yet we saw a reduction in body weight in the two doses of, of DAPA, 
compared to placebo. Uh, this is statistically significant for DAPA10. And we saw, although this is slightly more messy, uh, reductions in systolic blood pressure, again, particularly with the higher dose uh, of dapagliflozin. Perhaps these are naturetic effects rather than glycemic effects, but there seems to be a disconnect here between HbA1c lowering and other cardiovascular uh, benefits um, of these uh, and, reduc and, and, and reductions in exposure to other cardiovascular risk factors. And then nephrologists are going to ask, well, are these drugs safe in patients with stage 3b to 4 chronic kidney disease? And I think this is reasonably reassuring. Um, there, were, there was no excess of hypoglycemic events in those patients with stage 3b to 4 CKD receiving um, dapagliflozin. There were four serious hypoglycemic events, all were in the placebo group. There's an excess of genital infections, as we might predict. There's an excess of renal function um, SAEs. Now, these were mainly reductions in GFR in the higher dose of dapagliflozin. But when it came to looking at acute kidney injuries, and that's a, a certain magnitude of reduction in eGFR over a short period of time, in fact, there are only four events. And again, all of those were in the placebo group. So no apparent um, concerns here about uh, acute kidney injury. So I'm going to end just by telling you what, what's happening. We've heard about Credence already. Uh, Credence is recruiting patients, uh, all of whom have um, established kidney disease. GFRs between 30 and 90 uh, and ACRs uh, in this range of 33.9 to 565.6 milligram per millimole. All these patients need to be on an ACE or an ARB because this is standard of care in this population. So we're looking at the effects of canagliflozin in 100 milligrams versus placebo on top of ACE ARB therapy. And the primary outcome, as you've heard, is very much a kidney outcome of end-stage kidney disease doubling uh, or renal or cardiovascular death. And then the DAPA CKD study uh, is a study, obviously, of dapagliflozin. GFRs down to a slightly lower level here of 25 uh, mil per minute. So stages two to four patients, uh, all of whom uh, need to have albuminuria and to be on stable or uh, stable max or we're attempting to maximize doses of ACE and ARB. And the exciting thing about this study is we are recruiting patients who have chronic kidney disease, both with and without type 2 diabetes, um, aiming uh, to randomize 4,000. And the intervention is dapagliflozin 10 versus uh, um, placebo. And the uh, endpoint is very similar to the one I've just described, 50% sustained decline in EGFR onset of ESRD or death due to cardiovascular or uh, untreated end-stage kidney disease. And I understand there's also an empagliflozin uh, kidney outcome trial um, that's just kicking off. So I rose to Bernie's challenge this morning and wanted to give a, a nephrologist perspective on, on how these drugs work. Um, so this is from a kidney perspective, um, medications that use the kidney control diabetes and reduce cardiovascular risk. This is hugely exciting um, to us as nephrologists. And I'm just going to leave you with my take-home messages and say once again, thank you for inviting me to speak. <laughs>